Oncologists often advise their patients to stick to their usual routines when going through cancer treatment. The familiarity might help them relax and not ruminate on what comes next. Plumber Frank Marchand knows this instinctually. The Waitley, Massachusetts resident was diagnosed with colon cancer seven years ago. Aside from a few breaks for surgery, he hasn't taken time off throughout his ongoing chemotherapy. New England Public Media's Karen Brown wanted to understand why. I knew I wanted to do a story on my plumber, Frank Marchand, when he first showed up to my house for a job wearing a hospital bracelet. Turns out he was just back from a chemotherapy appointment, and when I apologized for asking him to work under those circumstances, he assured me there was nowhere he'd rather be. So the next time I called him to figure out why my toilet tank was leaking, I asked if I could bring out my tape recorder. So I don't know how, I don't even know how old this thing is. It's not that old because it's 1.6 gallons. Okay. Frank is sitting on the floor of my bathroom, tightening the bolts at the base of my water tank. His hair goes down to his shoulders, loose clothing on his tall, thin frame. Let's see what happens here. See, paper towels in that toolbox right there. His hospital bracelet is still hanging on his wrist from his cancer treatment that morning. This is my 94th chemo treatment. That's over the course of seven years, since a colonoscopy at age 60 found stage 4 colon cancer. By now, he's had two major surgeries and doesn't expect to be cured, but hopes the bi-monthly treatments at Cooley Dickinson Hospital will extend his life. I look at the nurse and say, why don't you go out for breakfast? I'll take care of the rest of this, because I know where all the tubes connect and I'll start the equipment and stuff. Over the years, he's gotten to know a lot of people at the hospital, including some from his life growing up in Franklin County. I call them hellmates in the chemotherapy room. One of them was my chemistry teacher from seventh grade. And I I looked at him and said, what the hell are you doing? Are you visiting somebody? Because now I got leukemia. That was last year, and his former teacher didn't live long after. And I've known him and his wife for years, doing their plumbing work and getting in that nasty crawl space under their house. I was in the the line to express my condolences at at the wake. And his wife, Janet, was first in line. She said, oh my God, he was like enough that even his plumber showed up? There. We're still tightening it. It's weird that it's so loose. Frank Marchand has been a plumber for 47 years, most of it working for himself. Throughout that time, he's become enamored of water, from what flows through household pipes to all bodies of water, especially the beach. But it all started when he was 12, living in Sunderland, across the street from a narrow brook. And I would go over there after school each day ripping sod out of the side banking and damming that brook up. And when I was successful enough to actually stop the water, it would find its way around my dam and wash it out. And I was frustrated that I could never control that. So I think planted in my brain was the concept that whenever water misbehaves, you're responsible for making it behave. So, all right, so about my toilet, what do you think? I'm gonna see if I can find another handle for that. Sometimes, on his plumbing rounds, Frank meets clients facing the same cancer ordeal that he is, like at one couple's home. A man was on his sofa, down to 85 pounds. Uh, They called because they didn't have any hot water. But he hadn't eaten in about a week, and he was destined for hospice. When Frank was done fixing their water heater, he came back upstairs to sit with a dying man and offer some advice. Have you ever thought about what you're going to think about on your deathbed? I mean, you don't want to lay there bouncing around wondering, why me, why me, and concentrate on that. He goes, no, I haven't thought about it. Well, Frank had, and he said he wasn't planning to dwell on his mistakes or regrets. But what I'm going to spend my time thinking about while I'm on my deathbed is the best corned beef hash I ever had in my life. The Green Heron in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, and they... they almost incinerated the potatoes here, burned on the outside and really soft inside. Caramelized onions, <clears throat> and just before serving it, they mixed in shredded boiled cabbage. And, oh my God, I loved it so much. I sat there and ordered another plate of it. Those transcendent moments, Frank told the man, that's what he wants to think about at the end. His wife called me after he died to say that he, he took to heart what you were saying, and he was peaceful. 
As Frank tells me the story, his hands submerged in my water tank, I notice him coughing a lot. <coughs> These masks are so full of dust. Do you want some water? Can I give you some water? I think so. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. I had to wonder, wouldn't it be easier for him to take a medical leave? At 67, he could certainly justify retirement, cancer or not. I told myself from the very beginning that my immune system is going to have to work really hard to fight this disease that I can't control. So do I want to sit on the sofa, watch TV, eat chips, and worry about what's growing inside of me? Because now it's going to deal with, with bile and anxiety and angst about what's going on that you can't control. Plumbing, on the other hand, is one of the few things he can control. I mean, when I'm, when I'm doing work, if that valve right there doesn't work, I need to know exactly where to go to the next one that will stop, will stop the water if this breaks off in my hand. But I still want to know, how does he cope with what he knows is coming, with mortality itself? For a time, he had help from a voice in his head, his childhood imaginary friend. The same friend who kept him company when he was three years old, playing with toy dump trucks. The memory is still vivid. And my mom comes out of the house and she looks at me and says, who are you talking to? My friend. But there's nobody there. Yes, there is. My friend is here. In the intervening decades, Frank stopped hearing from the friend through marriage, children, divorce, second marriage, until shortly after his surgeon told him in a recovery room, the cancer was terminal. And I'm lying on the bed completely alone, scared out of my wits. And who shows up but the imaginary friend? He goes, hey, what's going on? You're shaking. Why are you shaking? I, I, I don't know. I mean, the news that I just got, I have no idea how much time I have left. I know I'm never going to get to finish the projects that I started, all the things I'd hoped for in my life. I, I just got a limited amount of time. And he says, you know, I, I, you don't know this, but I've been with you all your life, watching every move you make. And I can understand how you're, you're anxious about having to do this, but I'm not going to let you do this alone. I'm going to go with you. But eventually, the friend says, once he knows Frank is okay, he will leave. And you have to find me. And when you do find me, you'll see that I found the nicest beach and saved a lounge chair for you. Of course, Frank tells me he knows there's no actual friend. It's his own voice, his own conscience. And yet... That experience took the weight of 20 tons off my shoulders to come to the realization that I'm not immortal and to prioritize the time that I have left because you don't know how much time that is. By the time Frank is done talking, and I'm just about in tears myself, I almost forget that he came over to fix my toilet. I, just, I come in and scare the hell out of the plumbing. See, that's all fixed now. Is Oof. it? <laughs> you fixed it? Where, where, where okay. So I'm planning to call you when I need to replace it. So you're going to answer the phone then, right? That would be the plan. If it rings to heaven, then you got the wrong number. A few weeks later, my radiator started to leak, and Frank came back. Hospital bracelet on his wrist, stories to tell, and no plans to stop. For New England Public Media, I'm Karen Brown. I, I actually am Karen Brown. That was my bathroom on those pictures. <laughs> and... Um, I was really delighted when Frank asked me to, to speak. Um, you know, in my line of work, I meet a lot of people with incredible life experience and, and poignant challenges, but they don't always have the skills to articulate what they're going through within a compelling narrative. And I also meet a lot of people, a lot of remarkable storytellers who have the gift of the gab, but they don't always have a core message or an experience that really resonates with the world at large. So when I first started talking to Frank, you know, his hands were literally in my toilet tank. He was telling me what it's like to sit next to your chemistry teacher in the chemo room at Cooley Dickinson. 
Um, that's when I realized that Frank is a true storyteller who also has something to say and a perspective worth hearing. And it soon became clear that nothing was off limits. As you're about to hear, he wasn't scared to talk about dying, as long as you put it in the context of living. He wasn't even scared to talk about being scared. And he can be quite vivid, shall we say, with his language. <laughs> the, the guy has spunk. Um, you know, the next time he came over to fix my plumbing, I had the presence of mind to turn on my tape recorder, and that's pretty much all I had to do. I just let it run. Uh, my editors at New England Public Radio and NPR agreed people needed to hear this. I do believe Frank has been carrying around these thoughts and insights in his head for decades, just waiting to be asked about them, or sometimes not waiting. Um, but there may actually be one more reason he never minded sitting among my kitchen or bathroom pipes for hours, making sure every story he told me had an elaborate beginning, middle, and end. Because when I eventually got the plumbing bill, he charged me for every minute. <laughs> As I said, the, the guy has spunk. So now, here is Frank Marchand and the stories that you've paid for in the premiere of I Can Die Happy Now. Do you mind if I think outside the box? <laughs> oh, it's comfortable in here. Oh. <laughs> and I know you folks have all had to pay for your seats. I, I promise you, if you come to my wake or my funeral, it will be free. <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna wander down here for a moment. Where did all you people come from? <laughs> Good evening. Hello. I'm Frank. I'm Joan. Nice to meet you, nice Joan. Nice to meet you as well. You know what the difference is between being in that box and being in that chair? No. Breathing. Because ah. <laughs> when you stop breathing, when I stop breathing, when every single one of you stops breathing, nobody's getting out of this alive. That's your destination. So don't you think you take for granted the 14,000 times a day that you inhale and exhale? So just as an exercise, don't anybody go crazy. Don't be fainting. On the count of three, I want you to hold your breath for as long as you can. One, two, three. Getting scary, isn't it? And when you take that first breath in, and all that oxygen goes back into your body, you resume remembering that you don't care that you're breathing. But one day, and you don't know when that day is, you're going to inhale, you're going to exhale, and you're not going to be able to inhale. Sad but true. So bear in mind that every breath you take, you exhale, and you can... Convert that exhalation into words of praise, love, encouragement. We don't know how much time you have to do that. Use that breath. I'm going to start off with uh, a story that doesn't belong in this presentation at all, but it's, it's, it's important enough that I want to include it. 
uh, mainly because it's content and what you leave with after you've heard it. So I kind of miss the days back 20, 25 years ago when I'd be working on a new house and we're all working together, the carpenters, the electricians, the plumbers, and 12.30 would come around and it was lunchtime. Nobody had a cell phone. Nobody had to be on their smartphone. And we'd be forced to sit there on a pile of lumber and talk to each other. And topics ranged from their, you know, the, the nasty mother-in-law to health issues to what happened with the dog. And usually it was just banter back and forth, telling the latest joke. But this one afternoon, we're sitting there having lunch, and one of, the, one of my coworkers came up with this story that just stayed with me all my life and will continue until I no longer can breathe. He was telling me that he used to go to visit his grandmother in, uh, I think it was in Cleveland. She was late 80s and his parents would pay the bus fare for him to get on the Greyhound bus when he was 14 years old, make the trip by himself and stay with his grandmother for seven to 10 days and then come home. He looked forward to it because the grandmother was uh, very, very fond of him as, as her favorite grandchild. So he'd arrive, she'd p meet him at the bus station, bring him home, and they would just catch up for four hours. Like, what, what have you been doing? Look at how much you've grown. And typically degraded after four hours to, well, okay, well, I know everything that happened to you, you know everything that happened to me. And it would always come around to this topic of, Grandma, can you tell me another story about you growing up? And so she'd say, well, do you mean the one about where we all came here as immigrants from Poland and we weren't accepted and we were allowed to be working in the mill and we were okay to go to the grocery store, but we couldn't be part of any of the activities in town and they didn't want to see us? No, Grandma, not that story. You mean about how the guys, all the husbands worked at the mill and worked 12 hours and they take crates away, uh, apart at the end of the day and they'd bang the nails out of them, straighten the nails out and put the nails in their pocket and each one of them had to come home with 10 boards over their shoulder every day to build the houses? No, Grandma, not that story. I want to hear the story about Josie. You always want to hear the story about Josie. <laughs> well, I like that story. All right. So in this neighborhood, which was basic, basically an ethnic neighborhood. All the Polish people are going there. The houses that they built from scratch, one at a time, were filled with families full of kids. And the kids were always running up and down the streets. Every mother looked out for every other kid. So at one point, um, the, the grandmother's name is Emma, she says, I, I'm, I'm looking out my front window and I'm noticing something different in the house across the street. They have a dog. Now we can't afford a dog in this neighborhood. We can barely eat. How is that dog going to survive? And the neighbors came out with a dog, which was a, a border collie named Josie. And Josie, Josie was like the best buddy of everybody on the street. Josie was a, a, a policewoman, a, a babysitter, a caretaker, and a security, all in the same. But the kids loved her. And she, Josie would run the street, and, and she had this, with all the responsibilities she had, she knew what order things happened. For example, the bus comes at 8 o'clock, Monday through Friday, and there's like 22 kids on the street that are going to get on that bus. So Josie rounds them up, nipping at their heels, gets them all ready to go on the bus. And once the kids are on the bus, Josie's free to do whatever she wants. She goes into people's houses, everybody knows her, she's got a water dish in every house. And there's those days when Jimmy, who's always late to get on the bus, Jimmy's late, the bus is in sight, and Josie runs down the street, goes to the house where Jimmy lives, barks like crazy at the door. Jimmy finally comes out. She bites at his ankles all the way to get him on the bus on time, and he makes it. And there's other days when, hey, Jimmy's not here, clicks in her brain, runs down the street to Jimmy's house, barks at the door, and, and the, the, Jimmy's mom comes to the door and goes, Josie, he's sick. He's not going to school today. And Josie looks up and goes, bolts back to the bus. She understood it all. So 
time goes on and the family across the street who own the dog and care for the dog, even though the dog's in everybody else's house, the husband gets a, a job offer and they're going to have to move. And they hate to think about the fact that they can't bring the dog. And so that family comes over and meets with Emma and says, Emma, you're the oldest person on the street. It's the quietest house because you have no children. Would you care for Josie? And Emma said, of course I will. She's always welcome here. But it's a quiet house, so when, when Josie's had enough, she can come sleep with you. We got, we got it. So they bring over the bed and another water dish and what food they had. And they have their tearful goodbye, the family and the dog. And the, the family does move away. Josie's mopey for a couple of days, but she's where she belongs because she owns the street. So she goes through her routine every day, but this mysterious time between 2 o'clock and 3.30, no one can find Josie. And like, where does she go for that hour and a half? And no one knows. So one day Emma is upstairs, and she's looking out the second floor bedroom window, and she spots Josie. And the, the entire area that they were in was really land that no one wanted. They were sequestered there because nobody wanted the land. It was surrounded by train tracks. So there's this train track that goes through their, her backyard, and there's Josie laying on the ground, looking down the tracks. And the train comes through at 2.04 every day. She sees the train, she stands up, her ears go up on end, and as she sees the train running, coming, she starts running alongside the train, and the engineer is hanging his hand out the window. Come on, girl, I'll race you. Let's do this. We can do this together. And the dog chased the train for about a quarter of a mile until the train had to go through a tunnel. And I think Josie figured she couldn't fit alongside it, so she'd stop there and find her way back and be back for 3.30 to greet the kids coming off the bus. So Emma didn't believe this was going on, but she would go upstairs to the window, and if it's 2.05, Josie's barking because the train is late. But she would race along that track, alongside the train, for years. And as time went on, Josie's starting to feel her age. So as she's running alongside the train, which always seems to be accelerating with all the cars leaving town, Josie's trying to come up to speed, and the engineer looks down and he goes, it's okay, girl, we can do this together. You're such a wonderful companion. I'll slow the train down. So the engineer slowed the train down. She'd make it almost all the way to the tunnel. And then day after day after day, she couldn't quite make it there. And at one point, the engineer, who's still yelling words of encouragement to her, says, Joe's, uh, he didn't know her name, actually. So, look, look girl, it's, it's okay. I understand. Um, I, I, I can't go any slower, though, or I'm going to lose my job. And, and so the dog basically understands. And then a couple of weeks go by, and now Josie's just walking alongside the train while the engineer's still going, you got it in your girl. You can do it. You know I love you. And then it got to the point where Josie would only stand and the engineer would slow down and greet her and wish her a good day and I hope you get better soon. And the, and the engineer came through one day and Josie was gone. She wasn't there. And the next day he came through and the dog wasn't there. And the third day he came through, Emma was in the backyard and he stopped the train. And he said, where's the dog? And she said, she died two days ago. And the engineer started crying his eyes out. He said, that girl was the high point of my day, every day. We had a rapport like I've never had with a human being before. I love that dog. And Emma said, she loved you too. He said, what was her name? He said, Josie, my condolences on your loss. And she looked at him and said, I think you lost more than I did. So every day from there on, 
That conductor came through at 2.04, slowed the accelerator on the train, looked at where Josie used to be, and made the train make this mournful sound from the whistle. Then he'd accelerate and keep on going. And to this, this workman's knowledge, he did that every day up until his grandmother died. Why can't we be that way with people? Just, 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 for, just for Charlie to see what you got out of this. Um, tell me what emotions, what traits trigger in your mind that make you want to love that dog and love that story. Because to this day, every time I hear a train whistle, I'm waiting to hear that mournful sound that brings me back to that dog that's the, the gist of this story that I probably never would have heard in my life if I hadn't been sitting on a pile of lumber with a bunch of contractors. Um, I, I mean, it's the takeaway is um, trust, competition, adoration. Come on, more? Loyalty. Loyalty. Nice and loud. Love, there you go. <laughs> uh, it, but it runs the gamut. When you, when you think of this, these are all the qualities you'd love to see in other people. And it's as simple as dedicating yourself to the fact that you're not going to live forever. And with the time and the breath that you have left, you can change. And, and we'll get much more into this, but uh, I guess I should get back on track. <laughs> But honestly, when you, when you hear a train whistle from this point on, don't you think you might listen for that little tweak and it brings you back to that spot and back to that story? Okay, so I've divided this program into two halves. A long story is it goes from BC to AD, okay? <laughs> BC is before cancer, AD is after diagnosis, okay? So BC is the first half, I'll give you a rundown. I was born in Frankfurt, Germany on a military base. My dad was in the army. And I, I left there without much knowledge of what I was doing there uh, at age two. I think my mom had to drag my dad out of a tent at the Oktoberfest so we wouldn't miss the flight. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, we, we, we got to the United States and it's, it's, the funniest thing is like 40 years later, I'm boarding a plane with my son to take him to play soccer against the locals in Europe, and my plane is destined to land in Frankfurt, Germany. So my mom's alive at the time, and I said, hey, Ma, listen, I haven't been back to Germany since I was born, and I'm going to be landing in Frankfurt, and I'm willing to take a cab to go by the hospital where I was born if you can remember the name of it. And she looks at me and says, I'm sure they tore that hospital down right after you were born. It's like, I love you too, Mom. <laughs> so now we end up, because we're military, we're, we're moving around everywhere. And we end up in this entire row of brick duplexes, side by side, up and downs, and it's all the way up and down the street. I'm two years old or so, and my mom had befriended a number of women in the neighborhood, and especially the one directly across the busy street from us. So the phone rings, and my mom picks it up and goes, hello? And the woman on the other end is laughing hysterically. And she's saying, Idri, <laughs> Idri, is your son supposed to be taking a nap now? And she goes, yeah, why? Uh, is he in the upstairs bedroom on the right-hand side? Yeah, why? Because he's, he's in the window, butt naked, spread eagled. <laughs> He's, so he's like, he's got the glass in front of him and the pull down shape behind him. He's still on display for the neighborhood. <laughs> and my mother goes, you're kidding me. She goes, no, I'm gonna watch out the window. I wanna see what happens when you pull a shade up. <laughs> <laughs> Tiptoes into the bedroom. <laughs> you little shit. Grab me. Put my clothes back on, laughing hysterically the entire time. She looks out the window, her neighbor's still over there crying. So my, she tells my dad when he comes home from work, 
you wouldn't believe what this kid did today. He goes, oh, we'll see about that. So he goes upstairs to my nursery, takes the mattress out, throws it on the floor, and you know that board you take out so you can fold it up? Well, he nails that in, puts me on the mattress, flips the thing upside down, and now I'm in a penitentiary. <laughs> it's, their dad loved me. So now I've gotten a little bit older, and I have my own sandbox. I don't have any friends, because we've moved so many times. I've been to you know, a different nursery school, different kindergarten, and when I just start getting to be friends with somebody, we move again. So I'm in the sandbox, and I'm, I'm bored, and this image shows up. And it's, it's, it's like I'm, I'm talking to something that's not even really there. It doesn't, it, there's no face, there's no name, there's no voice, but I feel this entity beside me. And so I start talking to this, turns out to be my imaginary friend because I didn't have a friend. I, I made one, so he, he, he'd be with me all the time. So, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you take that dump truck and fill it all the way up to the top with dirt, all the way to the top? And I want to bring it over here. We'll make a great big pile. And nothing happened. He didn't do anything. <laughs> so I, don't worry. I'll do it for you. So I pile it all up. And that's when my mom comes out of the house and is like, who are you talking to? It's like, my friend. There's nobody here. Yes, there is. My friend is here. Whatever. So she goes in the house. And this, this guy follows me around. He has no face. Every time I see him, he's sometimes got a Mexican sombrero on, so you can't see his face. Other times he's got a hoodie or he's in the shade. But I know he's there, and I can talk to him about anything. I can ask him questions. He doesn't answer me. Sometimes 10, 15 minutes later, the answer will come to me, and I think it's him talking to me. So he's basically a counselor, a mentor, a friend. Um, but as, as time goes on, I'm, I'm really bonding with this guy. Now, I have a tricycle. And my parents said, OK, look, you got the tricycle. I know you're going to love it. But what I want you to do is to go on the walkway from the house to the sidewalk. You can go back and forth as many times as you want, but we don't want to see you on the sidewalk. Because the sidewalk in front of our house was fairly level, and then it went down this really steep hill to a four-way intersection with busy traffic. <laughs> so I'm out there on my tricycle. My dad's at work. My mom's on the phone, peeking out the window, making sure I'm not getting in trouble. And so I go back and forth and back and forth on the walkway, back and forth and back and forth for two weeks. I'm like, this is boring. So I inch out onto the sidewalk, look back, make sure my mom's not looking, and I back up. And I back up, I go a little bit further. And, and the imaginary friend says, hey, what are you doing? I'm just going a little bit too far. You know, you're not supposed to do that. And there's a reason for that. You know that. Yeah, whatever. I look, my mom's looking out the windows. I'm back on the walkway. And she disappears again. And I take my tricycle out. And it's like, imagine friend, you know this is wrong. Yeah, I'm just going to go a little ways. One, two, three. One, two, three. Coming back up the hill. And one, two, three, four. Hey, one, two, three, four. Mom's looking back on the walkway. And I get out there, and you know, I have a friend saying, dude, you're not going to do this. You're, you're not going to do this. Well, I don't think it'll be bad. Feet start going. I'm heading down that hill. Now I'm going so fast, the feet come off the pedals, and now there's no way I'm going to stop. Going like a bat out of hell down the hill. He's yelling at me. Cut the wheel to the left. Go on the grass. Go on the grass. Don't go through the intersection. Go on the grass. I cut the wheel. Boom, 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 down the hill. Get launched off the tricycle right into the side of a brick building. <laughs> I'm laying there. I can, I can envision myself. Blood coming from my forehead. Loose teeth. Blood all over me. And I'm laying there screaming. And the imaginary friend's like, 
whatever. And this soldier's walking up the sidewalk. He comes into view around the end of the brick building. He looks over and he sees me like, he runs over. He's wearing a full uniform, the hat and everything. And he looks down at me. And like, My God, this poor kid. So he, he kneels down. I'm wailing away. And he's feeling to make sure I didn't break anything. And he, he realizes, well, he, he's beat up, but he's not broken. So he scoops me off the ground. And he says, where do you live? I don't know. <laughs> So he drags me to the first duplex and knocks on the door. And he goes, oh, my God, oh, my God. Because is this your son? No, that's Idris. She's six, six up on the right, the right-hand unit. So he marches me up the hill, blood dripping everywhere, knocks on the door. My mom comes to the door like, oh, my God, oh, my God. He goes, where do you want him? So she, he follows my mom into the house. This is back when you can totally trust people. And, and my mom had been ironing. And so she cleans off the ironing board. She says, just lay him on there. I remember laying there. I'll never forget the sensation of the warmth. And I'm bleeding everywhere. And the, the soldier says, um, you know, where are your washcloths? She goes, right in the bathroom, the cabinet over the toilet. Just, just grab a bunch of them. So he gets one wet on the way, and he comes back in. He goes, you want me to take him to the doctor? You want to call an ambulance? No, 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 no. I, I, I'm looking now, and I think, I think he's going to be OK, but he's really beat up. So finally. I'm under control, and I'm scraped and bruised and busted, you know, and, and my, my spirit is shot. And I get to that point where it's <laughs> and I look over at my imaginary friend, and he says, dumbass. <laughs> so, so we still got the tricycle, right? And now it's wintertime, so I can ride the tricycle downstairs where I can't go down a hill. So I'm allowed to go down there whenever I want. There's a big cellar, concrete floor, so I go around and around. So this one day, my mom, <laughs> my mom is on the phone again, and I spy on the kitchen table this, this container. And I take the cover off, because nothing was childproof back then, and I look inside, and there's these things that look like good and plenty, and I love candy. There's a pink one, and a black one, and a white one. And so I take those, leave the top off the container, and I, I taste them. Well, that doesn't taste sweet at all. Maybe the next one will be sweet. So I eat that one. No, well, that one's not sweet either. I'll try the third one. So I have all three of my mother's diet pills. Well, I go down in the basement, and I'm on that tricycle, and I'm doing 67 miles an hour. And my mom comes out, <coughs> she looks at the, oh my god. She looks at me downstairs, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm burning holes in the concrete floor. <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, she tips them out and counts them all. Oh, he took three of them. Oh my god. So she, she gets on the phone, calls the doctor, says, Doctor, I don't know how this happened, but he took three of my diet pills. I said, how much does he weigh? It's like 48 pounds, something like that. And the doctor says, well, it's not going to kill him, but you, you got some, some serious supervising to do for the next 24 hours. <laughs> if he stops breathing, call me. <laughs> so my mom, calls, my mom calls my dad at work. He says, Gerald, you're not going to believe this. He got into my diet pills. And my father's going, oh, God, and the kid didn't have enough energy to begin with. So honestly, I'm around and around for hours, as fast as I can. And finally, my mom says to me, um, I have to go upstairs and go to the bathroom. Will you please behave? Here? Yeah, around and around. So while she's gone, I'm looking up at the ceiling, and there's four light bulbs in the ceiling. And one is just a socket. The light's missing. Yeah. Grab the fishing pole. Stand up on a tricycle. Got it. Lights go out. I'm on the floor. <laughs> my, mother, my mother comes in, flipping the light switch. Like, what happened? She goes downstairs with a flashlight and laying on the floor. And she finally gets me to come alive. And, then I, then I crash. I totally crash. I think I'm out for 35 hours. <laughs> I come to, 
And I look over at my imaginary friend. He's still stone. He's, he's still wiped out on speed. Like, give, give, give you a couple of days. We'll, we'll get back together again. So I'm out, outside, still young, and I'm looking at this bumblebee. He's on a flower. And I'm thinking, I don't like bumblebees. And my imaginary friend's looking at him. What's the problem? It's like, I don't like bumblebees. Did they ever hurt you? No. What are you going to do? I'm going to kill them. Stomp on them like this. Get half of them. The beak curls around like this and stings me right in the toe. Like, ah, oh, wow, wow. I had to take my, my flipper off. And I'm like, ow. Oh. And I look at him. How can you tell me he's going to hurt me like that? Some things you got to figure out yourself. <laughs> so he was, um, he was, he was a guy who kind of like watched everything I did, and I learned through him because he was my friend, and I trusted him. And the things I did wrong steered me back in the right direction, but not good enough. <laughs> so about this time, my mom is feeling like she's really missing her mother. She lived like 150 miles away, and she didn't drive. So my mom says to my dad, honey, will you, will you go get grandma, get, get my mom and bring her here. Just, just stay for a week or 10 days so we can't stand each other anymore. And my dad says, yeah, I'll do that. So he retrieves my grandmother and brings her home. And I, I love my grandmother. I'm only five or six years old. And it, she's shaped like a pear. She's got greasy black hair, brill cream back. She has one tooth, but I love her. And so I'm watching her this one day, and she's doing this thing like, what is she doing? She put two pieces of white bread in the toaster and pushed the lever down, and she gets out the oleo margarine because we couldn't afford butter, and the toast pops up, and she puts it on a plate, and she takes the oleo, does one whole piece, takes the other one, puts butter on that one, and then she does this thing I've never seen before. She picks up one, and puts it together like this, with the oleo touching the oleo. And then she takes a knife, and she cuts it diagonally. I said, Grandma, what are you doing? Making toast. But why do you cut it at an angle like that? Because Mom always cuts it into two rectangles. I cut it in triangles because it tastes better. <laughs> and when you put it together like that, and you take a bite, you get twice the butter. I've never cut a sandwich differently since she told me that. <laughs> all my life, <laughs> whether she's right or wrong. But she also brought with her this marvelous invention way before all the musical stuff that we're used to. It was a small reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And she brought that along with a shoebox full of Showtime tunes that we could load in there. And she took the time to teach me how to put the spool in, feed it through the sprockets, feed it through the magnetic head, out the other side, through the other sprocket, and into the other empty reel. So she showed me how to turn it on. I'm five years old, and she's taught me how to do this, and I'm loving it. So at one point, one of the uh, tapes breaks. She breaks out the splicing kit, shows me how to do it. I'm listening to this thing all day long, and I've, I've never even heard these songs, but I'm starting to memorize them. So at the time that she's getting ready to leave, she said to me, you like that, don't you? I was like, I do. Well, how about if I leave it here and take it back the next time I come back? You can use it while I'm gone. I, Thank you, Grandma. Great big hug. So in the course of three or four months, I'd memorized every single one of those songs. And I'm thinking back, like, why would I do that? It, they were catchy, and it was novel. And who would guess that 50 years later, one of my friends would have a grandmother in an Alzheimer's unit who was turning 90. And the friend asked me to go to the 90th birthday party. Dorothy, who's the, the honoree, uh, she, was a, she was a hot ticket before she lost her memory and, and her, her, her direction. So 
She had a wheelchair, so we, we got a bicycle horn, we got pinwheels, we got pom-poms, and decked her out, but she didn't even know it was her birthday. She didn't remember us. And so we go into where, in the uh, solarium, and the cake is there, and all the family members, and she doesn't know any of them. And all of a sudden, this light goes on in the back of my head. I'm thinking, I say it out loud, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy. She starts singing. And all of a sudden, all the wheelchairs in the entire dementia Alzheimer's ward start moving. And they're all coming to the solarium, and they all know all the words, even though they can't remember their name or what they had for lunch. And because of that repertoire, that my grandmother gave me at that age and my ability to memorize that, we had the time of our lives that afternoon. All we did was sing. So you never know where your blessings are coming from, and especially when you're young and impressionable, that this stuff comes through, you, you annex it, you, you coordinate it, you collate it in your brain, but if you've got it there and you still have your brain, then it, it can come in useful, and, and children are so impressionable. Along with growing as a child and being um, you know, a sponge soaking up information and, and senses and things like that, my dad had, um, he came from a family of 12. He was the youngest. And he had a method of discipline which affected me a lot. So, I had chores to do, even when I was really little, and if they didn't get done, we had this routine. Pull down your pants, turn around, and bend over. It was a spanking. He never, ever really hurt me. It was to sting and remind you and humiliate you, and I was a bad kid, so I'm looking at three to five times a week. <laughs> and as, like, he doesn't even have to tell me anymore, just like, whatever. <laughs> But I'm, I'm not learning. But as I, as I grow older, it hurts more that he thinks that little of me. And this, one of the chores I had was to take out the trash. We lived in a two-story, it was a two-story colonial. We had the first floor. There were tenants above us, another family. And in order to get into the kitchen, which was the easiest way to get in the house, you had to go through the attached barn. And going through the attached barn to get in the back door wasn't that big of a deal, but the building behind the barn was a potato storage facility loaded full of rats. And every time I came in the door to the barn, there was a rat. And they're quick and they're noisy and the trash barrels in the barn. So day after day, I'm bringing the trash out, taking off the lid, seeing the stuff scattered everywhere. And I dropped the bag in only to find out, you know, two hours later, the lid's off, the trash is everywhere, the rats are all over it. And I had this one instance where I'm in our first floor apartment, and I opened the door to the basement just a little bit. There was dirt floor and no lights, and I shone a flashlight down there, and I saw the pink eyes of the rats. And I was petrified. I was sure that they were going to bite me, and they were everywhere. And this one day, I took the trash out, the lids off the can, and there's two rats in there. And I, I, like, I just said, I'm not going to drop the bag on top of the rats. So I put it beside the can, and a couple hours later, my dad comes home, and I totally know what to expect. And the words I heard when he walked in the house was, where is he? And I was in my bedroom, and my bed was going this way, and I was sitting like this with my back against the wall. And he came in and he says, pull down your pants, turn around, and bend over. And I didn't. I know I'm going to get killed. I said, pull down your pants, turn around, and bend over. And I still didn't. And he came towards me to unbuckle my pants. And with my back against the wall, I recoiled my legs, 
planted him firmly in his crotch, and slammed him into a bureau. Now I know I'm going to be killed. He stood there, motionless, awestruck, and walked out of the room. I cried for an hour. He came in and said, what are you crying about? I like, I'm, I'm afraid I hurt you. He didn't hurt me. Stop crying. He never touched me again. But the memory of what that felt like stayed with me and actually impacted me later on in my life. We'll get to that in a bit. So now I know that I'm probably not going to get spanked. So now I can get away with some stuff. Like, there's, uh, there's the colonial we live in, and set quite a ways away is the colonial that this very wealthy man lives in. We know he's wealthy because he's got a white Lincoln Continental, and he's got the copper roof, and he's, he's old and should be retired. He's got a wife and a daughter. And he doesn't like kids. So the yard from our house abutted the yard from his house. And the same guy mowed the entire thing, but there was no distinction between where one lawn ended and the other one took over. So we're out there playing football. I don't want you playing in my yard. We crossed the line. So we, okay, whatever, you know, we do our thing and the ball will get loose. And I told you to stay out of my grass. He, he was only out there when we were out playing. The rest of the time he was like in the house. But as soon as we started playing, he came out to, to yell at us. So. We're completely ignoring him. We're totally into this game. And we do this a couple weekends in a row. And next thing you know, we're playing. And, and yeah, the ball's definitely on his lawn. We go to get it. And a police car pulls into our driveway. And he goes up to my father. And my father's shaking his head. And, and they, call, they call us over. And kids, this guy's here about the ball going on the neighbor's lawn. He's like, and the, the police officer is like, I, I, I have to act on a complaint. He, and he's, he owns property in town. He's a taxpayer. He complained. I have to act on it. And my father's going, it's a football. <laughs> I, say, I know, I know, I know. But can you just, boys, can you please try to keep it on this side? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we continue playing. And of course, get it off my lawn. I'm going to call the cops again. So, you know, this is one afternoon we're out there. I look across the street, because we, we've been playing for like 10, 15 minutes, and the old man's on the porch, and he's still yelling at us. And I look, and this cop car in the parking the driveway across the street. It's like, he already called him. So here goes the ball. Bounces on his driveway. Cop pulls in the yard, doesn't say a word, opens the door, picks up the football, and drives away. <laughs> You don't want to wage war with me, I'm telling you that. So now we're sitting around like, what are you going to do without a football? And this guy pissed me off. So in that devious little mind of mine working overtime because I'm a bad boy, and everybody's already convinced I'm going to jail when I'm older, this light goes on away. Hey, I'm remembering something. Remember in the winter? This guy has got an electrically heated driveway. So when it gets cold, he goes down and goes turns on the power, and the driveway melts. I remember coming back from school. We're watching the snowflakes like land on the ground and melt before our very eyes. So we went and got snow shovels. We're shoveling snow on the driveway, like watching it melt. It's like, this is so cool. But somehow on that 104 degree day, I remembered that. And I watched as they loaded up the Lincoln Continental with the beach chairs and the cooler and the mom and the daughter. And they drove out the driveway. And because the statute of limitations is over, and I can get away with telling the story, <laughs> and because they're all dead, I, uh, I find my way down into the basement. And I find that knife switch on that 104 degree day. Then I, um, then I go home, 
And my dad was wearing this ratty pair of boots. I mean, really ratty. My mother's thrown them away 82 times. Each time he picks them out of the trash, even if there's banana peels inside of them, he doesn't care. These are, my, these are my boots, don't throw them away. But Gerald, they're ratty, I'm throwing them away. So I go into the barn and rats didn't eat the boots, so I pull them out. I go over there, put my little tiny feet in those great big work boots, and I walk the length of the driveway sinking in. The tar is so soft, you know, at the end. I turn around and I walk back. And I'm having the time of my life. Nobody's knowing what I'm doing with my father's boots on. And I have to say, okay, that's probably enough. Look what you did. Down in the basement, take my dad's boots off, put them in a paper bag, and bury them in the potato field in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could have seen the look on his face. I saw his head hanging out the window as he pulls through the driveway, watching each one of the footprints. We moved about a week later. And, <laughs> and next thing you know, we drive by like, oh look, he got a new driveway. Wonder what happened. <laughs> so the, I, 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 was, I was really bad as a kid. And like I say, most people said, when he grows up, he's going directly to jail. So, now I'm 12 years old, I've got baby fat all over me, and I get this job at a dairy farm for $2.25 an hour. And I show up on the first day of work, and there's a hay bale. I can't pick it up. And over the course of the summer, I'm forced to do that, so at the end of the summer, I can actually take a hay bale off the ground and launch it to the top of the wagon. I get back to school that year, and he goes, who's that new kid? Like, That's Frank. It's like, Cut it out. It was totally transformative. And so my, my, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with my dad. The, all, all the stuff ha it quieted down. And so he, he's, he's now my friend. And he, he calls me up. He says, hey, listen, I, I, the new car I just got, $250. I got to get an inspection sticker. Ride with me. So I hop in the passenger seat. We pull into the service stations, one-man operation, and my dad says, uh, he hollers down in the pit where Roy's changing oil. Hey, Roy, I need an inspection sticker. He goes, oh, sounds like Jerry. Uh, I'll be out in a couple minutes, but I'll walk around the car and tell you why I'm not gonna give you an inspection sticker before I, I give you an inspection sticker. <laughs> so he comes out, and he's wiping the oil off of his hands, walks around the car. Hmm. Jerry, I can't give you an inspection sticker. My father's hurt. Like, why not? There's nothing wrong with the car. There's plenty wrong with the car, but the reason I can't give you an inspection sticker is because there's a ding in the windshield that's in the path of the wiper blade. My father says, I could, I could totally see around that. Like, it doesn't matter. If there's a ding in the windshield in the path of the wiper blades, I have to fail you. So don't even bring it in. You don't want a rejection sticker. You got something valid near for a couple of weeks. My father's stewing. Roy goes back down under the car. And I'm seeing the smoke come from my father's ears. Aha. So he walks in, walks up to the workbench, grabs the hacksaw, comes out, grabs the wiper braid, cuts the last three inches off of it. <laughs> Takes the wiper blade and hacksaw. Puts the hacksaw back there. Hey, Roy, I'm ready for a sticker. Jerry, I told you you can't get a sticker because you got a, a ding in your windshield in the path of the wiper blades. Not anymore. <laughs> he got a sticker. <laughs> and my imaginary friend would say, learn from this guy. <laughs> totally. It was also a formative time where, like the day after Thanksgiving, my mom, God bless her soul, she'd start the day after Thanksgiving baking three dozen of the same cookies. Three dozen different ones the next day. Three, all the way through until like the week before Christmas. And she'd have bought cookie tins at yard sales and she'd make assortments of handmade cookies. She had a big chest freezer, all, everything was ready to go. And my father would have to drive her to give a tin of cookies to the mailman, to this guy at the service station, the people at the bank. And so, again, it's all impressionable when you're a kid, 
but to see that they were as good as they were conceived as being bad. So my imaginary friend abandoned me when I said these words. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> he used to I'm out of here. You're on your own. And I didn't see him again until, as you know, later on. So I, I bounced around from part-time job to part-time job and ended up at an auction gallery. And I was intrigued by that, holding the objects, learning what they were, learning their value. And I loved it so much that I actually paid for my trip to Mason City, Iowa, to the Reich Auction College. Uh, it, it was intensive training. I don't know if I could go through it again as an adult. It was wild. But in, it, it, I, I came back able to go, I'm bid 80, not a 5, bid a 5, 85, I'm bid 90, 90, bid a 5, 90. Yeah, so that stuck with me. And my dad saw that I was enjoying this so much that he worked there. He said, I'm going to work with you. And again, we became closer as he would get on one end of an upright piano, I'd be on the other end, and we would pick it up and carry it through the house so as not to mar the floor. So we, we, we teamed up, and one day he takes me aside, and he says to me, there's something we need to clear up. So what's that? You know that whole incident about what I was doing to you? Um, understand where I came from. So I was the youngest of a family of 10 kids and two parents, and my dad, was a brutal disciplinarian, as was his dad and his dad. So let me tell you what I experienced. I'm five years old, just about six, and I'm going to be going into first grade. The tradition in our family was whoever the child was who was just entering school in the first grade would be the one to ride with mom on the train into Boston, which meant that She's going to go in, she's going to find the cheapest clothes she can find, ones that are improperly sewed together, ones with stains on them, and she will make them look like brand new clothes for the first day of school for everyone. Every child had one new outfit. So the youngest one would go with mom into the city to become a clothes horse. So they, they, they got to the city and he says, I was so amazed. I'm like six years old and I'm on a train for the first time. And I'm watching as the railroad crossing signs come down. We're going fast. And all the horses and the cars and the trucks, they're all stopping for us. I was, the scenery went by so fast, that, but we were boss. And we made it into Boston and we first started, we started shopping right away. And so my mom's piling clothes on me. She goes, are you okay? Said, yeah, I am I okay. And, and by noontime, I had like, 12 articles of clothing on me, like I'm weighing down. And, and my mom says, okay, let's break for lunch. And we ended up at the automat. Now, you understand that when I was three years old, I was going to the bakery to buy two-day-old bread, filling the wagon with as high as I could and dragging that home, and our family ate that in a day. We didn't have much. But I'm looking at this, the windows the chrome framed windows of a wall full of every kind of food you want. And everything was 10 cents. My mom gave me a dime and said, get whatever you want. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't make up my mind. It all looked so delicious. And my mom said, we only have five minutes left. You've been staring at that for 15 minutes. Make your decision. So I put my dime in. I opened the door, I could smell all of that, and I could feel the cold air coming at me. I, I slid the plate out, and I sat down, and I ate the sandwich. I don't even remember what kind of sandwich it was. It was just the best sandwich I ever had. <laughs> so then she says, okay, let's get going. So we load everything up. Now it's 4.30 4 in the afternoon, we gotta get back. We get on the train, I fall asleep on the train with all the clothes on me, and we get there, and we finally make it back home. And I'm just taking the clothes off of me, and my, my dad comes in, your grandfather. My dad comes in, and he's been working at the, at the boot shop all day long, making boots. The only sole source of income for the whole house. And my father looks at me and says, 
I, I, my friend told me this afternoon that there were a bunch of kids breaking windows in the factory. And uh, he, he said he, he, he saw you. And he said, it couldn't be me. I was with mom all day. And the, I was in Boston. And he looked at me, and my mom, he, he says, my mom says, he, it couldn't have been him. He was with me from the time we left in the morning until now. He's in my eyesight the entire time. He said, I looked at my father, and my father said, I believe my friend. And he beat the hell out of me. So the discipline I was giving you was mild by comparison. I said, well, thanks for the story, Dad, but that whole thing ends with me. When I have children, I'll never raise my hand to them. I'll find out other ways to make them disappointed in themselves, but it won't be physical abuse. And he looked at me and he cried and said, thank you for stopping the chain. So who would guess that later on in life, he'd be my best man at my first wedding. Um, so as time went on, I found that, okay, the, the auctioneering thing was fun, but I'm kind of over that, and I was really into music. And so I supported myself for two years uh, doing a one-man show, check it out. Uh, but I was a musician, and, and uh, I, I earned a, a workable living uh, playing six-string guitar, 12-string guitar, electric guitar, electric sitar, mandolin, banjo, ukulele, and Victorian pump organ, ragtime keyboard, guitar, harmonica, kazoo, and fiddle. <laughs> Thank you. Then I became a plumber. <laughs> 47 years ago. I married my first wife, had two kids, had to pull life support on my father. I got divorced. I held my mother's hand while she died of cancer and realized that I was alone. But my career, my job, gave me hope, promise, and entertainment. So I'm gonna share a couple stories, absurd stories, true stories, because this is too stupid, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> this was probably four years ago. The phone rings. Um, Marshan Plumbing. Yeah, yeah listen, um, I wonder if you could help me out. What can I do for you? We have got this nasty sewage smell in our house. We have no idea where it's coming from. The house is 19 years old. It's a poured concrete foundation, concrete floor. There's no water on the floor anywhere, but it stinks. And every day it seems to be getting worse. I said, well, can you give, give me a time frame of when it maybe started happening? I'd say probably six weeks ago. It was, it was mild and just, it, it keeps building. So all through the summer we could leave the windows open and it wasn't a big deal because we turned the air over. But now the weather's getting cold and we're closing the windows and it is putrid. So my, now listen, my husband's pretty handy. So he pulled the toilet on the first floor and put in a new seal. And we hoped for a couple, you know, figure a couple of days and the smell didn't go away. So we did the toilet on the second floor. Still didn't go away. So he climbed up on the roof and stuck a garden hose in the vent pipe and let it run for 45 minutes. Still there. So we had our septic tank dug up. They pumped the tank and the smell is still here. And it's getting worse every day. We were gone for the weekend. We came home, opened the door, and we can't stay in the house. It's that bad. Okay, give me, a, give me an hour, I'll be over there. No promises. So I'm thinking, cut off vent pipe, there's a broken fitting, uh, but I said, where's the, where's the smell concentrated? It's all through the house. I, I guess if you had to ask me, I'd say the basement. So I show up, I open the, the, the storm door, I'm like, whew, I haven't even gotten in the house yet and I can smell it. So she opens the door and says, can you smell that? It's like, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can, yeah. And she goes, it's awful, isn't it? I said, it is. Okay, so you say it's worse in the basement than anywhere else. I think so. So let me start down there. So I'm down there and, and like, I'm twisting fittings to make sure they're not broken. There's no water on the floor, but there's, there's 
bicycles and air conditioners and canoes and cardboard boxes, all the kinds of stuff all over the place. There's no water on the floor and there's really minimal plumbing. So I'm down there for 20 minutes and I can't breathe. So I head upstairs and she goes, did you find anything? It's like, not yet. What are you doing? I said, I'm going out for some fresh air. She goes, I understand. <laughs> so I walk around the house I realize my clothes now reek of that smell. And the septic tank is still dug up. So I get down on my hands and knees, grab one of the covers out of it, stick my head right in the tank and take a deep breath. It's like, that's not the same smell. So I catch some more fresh air and I go back in. And she goes, you got any ideas? Like, I'll tell you one thing, it's not plumbing related. She goes, how do you know? I stuck my head in the septic tank. It's a different smell. <laughs> okay, so what are you going to do? I, I, I know it's not plumbing related, so it's not something that I have to fix, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a concerted effort and go down one more time. So I walk down there, and I'm like, wow, it seems stronger over here by the oil tank. And so I'm walking over there, and there's this cardboard box that's partway open, and there's these two big Ziploc bags, and they're like, I have no idea what's in them. It's like amberish, gooey, whatever. And I kneel down, and it's, oh my God, oh my God, oh, that's it right there, whatever that is in those bags. So, sorry, clip me on there. So I go upstairs, and she, she, this woman's got this look on her face, expressing like 50 different kinds of emotions. She's angry, she's frustrated, she's hopeful, she's scared. And she says, did you find anything? I like, I found it. What is it? Well, there's this cardboard box with these two big Ziploc bags, and there's this amberish, gooey, I can't hear, <gasps> My pets. <laughs> what? My pets. What are you talking about? Oh my God, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. I had a pet cat and a pet rabbit and they died during the winter. And I put them in Ziploc bags and I put them in the chest freezer downstairs so that in the spring I could dig a hole and bury them. And I'm just remembering now, it's like four months ago, I reached in and I must have taken the box out and I forgot to put it back in the freezer. <laughs> Understand that the smell that's permeating your house is what's leaching through the plastic. If you accidentally rip one of those bags open, you will never sell your house. You need, you don't need me, because you're not, I'm not triple bagging that and taking it out of the house for you, okay? Those, 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 that's your responsibility. But I'm gonna tell you now, you need four people. On the corners of the box, you slide the tray underneath it, just in case it's leaking, you don't wanna rip it open, pick up the other side, get it on the tray, and the four of you, like nitroglycerin, take that thing outside, already have the whole dug and throw the box in and everything, fill it in. She goes, oh my God, I can't you're going to tell everybody the story, aren't you? I said, I am, but I'm not going to use your name. She, she says to me, can I pay you now? It's like, as fast as you can. I'm out of here. And every day when the phone rings, you, you have no clue. Uh, another, another one. And... and I, I usually don't people use people's names or locations or anything, but this one's a kind of a dead giveaway, and it's under new, new ownership anyways. So I get this phone call at quarter after midnight. It's the local strip club. <laughs> hey, you gotta come right now. The toilets are overflowing. Sewage's back up and they... <laughs> Guess what? I'm not going there. <laughs> what do you mean? 
I, I can be there at eight o'clock in the morning. I've taken care of all the plumbing in the building. I always do it during the hours when you're closed. I don't want my lettered vehicle in your parking lot when you're open for business, because that's bad for my business. No, I'm telling you right now, I, I, got, I, I, call, I called the owner and I'm the manager and you need to get your ass over here now. I said, like, you close in half an hour. Everybody's drunk. No one's gonna care. I'll see you at eight o'clock in the morning or you can try to find somebody else at this hour of the night. Fine, I'll be there at eight. So eight o'clock in the morning, I'm there with a couple of workers and he shows up and he unlocks the door to the basement, unlocks the bar, says, okay, make yourself at home. Lock up on the way out. So he, he was right. I mean, everything was clogged up. So take a barrel, bring it into the basement, take the clean out plug off and some of the effluent goes in there. And it's like 200 feet from here to the septic tank through the parking lot. So we know we, we got to run this snake though, probably the entire length. So we're, we're feeding the thing in and I've used this machine like a thousand times. And I'm hearing this noise like, what the hell is that noise? It's like this metal against metal sound. I, I, can't, I can't figure it out. So we get in 20 feet, it's like, pull it back. Let's see what's going on. So as we're pulling it back, this waterfall of quarters starts <laughs> pouring into the barrel. It's like, we pull it back more. It's like, it's like we got a, a, a sewage bank account here. <clears throat> so I like, was scratching our head like, and of course, then we come back with the thong and the men's underwear and the condoms. But meanwhile, the coins are still coming. So we make it all the way to the tank. We, the snake is in the tank. We know we've made it, the line's clear. I said, okay, we're gonna pull it out. One of you stay there to make sure the water makes it to the tank. The other one downstairs, keep an eye on the pipe and make sure we didn't damage anything. And I'm gonna go upstairs and flush the toilet 10 times. So I go up there in the men's room bang the stall door open, hit the handle, it goes down, hit it again, 10 times. All good downstairs? All good. Hey, out of the parking lot, you making it? Yep, we're all set. Okay, so I'm leaving the stall, open the door, and directly in front of me is a urinal, and above it are two vending machines, one for condoms and one for men's cologne, and they only take quarters. So I'm envisioning the scene. Oops. Well, I ain't gonna reach in there and take it out. <laughs> Mystery solved. So we, we take the barrel out back and we dump the, the, the wastewater and everything out of it, you know, dig a hole in the ground, bury it. And we, it takes two of us to pick up the barrel and put it in the truck. We get back to the shop, nobody's gonna touch it. Four gallons of bleach. Let it soak for six months. So it's a, a beautiful sunny day, we lay out some plywood and we dump the barrel out and let the sun bake it all day long. So then we get out snow shovels and we're scooping the quarters up and putting them in five gallon pails. <coughs> Go to Coinstar and put on the gloves up in the machine. We had over $300 worth of quarters. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't make this shit up. It's just... Okay. Um, one, one more story, then I'll try, try to get back on track. So this elderly widow, she's late 80s, maybe even early 90s, she calls me and says, You've worked for my whole family. You've worked for my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my grandkids, and now I need you to help me. So what can I do for you? Well, I can't get my leg up over the, to the side of the bathtub anymore, and I, 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 the toilet's too low to the floor, so I want you to come over and tell me what it would take to dismantle the bathroom and put, take the tub out and put a shower in and put an elevated toilet and grab bars. I said, well, are you in a big rush? He goes, no, no. I said, are you, are you home on Saturday morning? I'm home all the time. I can't drive, Sonny. <laughs> I'll see you at 10 o'clock on Saturday. So I drive over there. She greets me at the door. She's got a little walker, and she's hard of hearing. So she says, so, okay, I'm, I'm walking in the bathroom. It is from 1945. Nothing has been done. Original faucets, 
the coral pink tile with the black accent stripe and the coral pink toilet and a coral pink sink. And I, really, you haven't, nothing's been updated in here. She goes, we've never had a problem. I said, okay, well, I, I do need to take a look at the plumbing down below here. And do you mind if I go downstairs? Don't expect me to go. I'll die going down those stairs. Like, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. So I, I go downstairs, and I'm in her um, late husband's workshop. And I'm looking at all the drainage is copper. I'm going, this is fantastic. And just cut that off to adapted plastic and go. And I'm looking at the underside of the bathtub. And where the back wall of the bathtub is cast iron, goes up like this, and it has a little lip. There's, I'm looking at the floor joists, and there's these holes cut in the subfloor. They're like big ovals between the, the joists. Like, why the hell would you do that? You can look up and see the back side of the, the, back side of the tub. And I see this cable coming down through, and I went, ah. It's a single story branch. Cable guy came in through the attic, drilled a hole down through the interior wall, pushed the wire down there and couldn't find it. So he cut these ovals, and sure enough, one of the wires is coming down through it. So I, I solved the problem in my brain, what's going on? <coughs> so I give her a price. She tells, asks me, when can you start? I said, it's your only bathroom. You're gonna be without a toilet all day long. I've got a little porta potty in the bedroom. I'm fine, I'm fine. So we schedule the day and get over there first thing in the morning. We're unloading the fixtures and all that, getting them out of the truck so we can work. And we go into the bathroom and we're pulling all the fixtures out. And it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, go for a power tool and nothing works. I must have tripped a circuit breaker or something. So I follow the cord back and there's, there's the little lady like this high. She's got both plugs in her hands. No wonder we don't have any power. Like, what are you doing? It's break time. Come sit with me. <laughs> so, we, we sit down at the kitchen table, and we have got silver silverware. We've got the tongs for the cubes of sugar. We've got the, the silver, sterling silver creamer. We've got, each got our own individual cups with saucers. And it, We've been smelling these homemade blueberry muffins for the last hour. So she pours us each our coffee, and she says, now you're not going anywhere until I tell you you can go back to work. <laughs> okay. So we sit down, and we're, uh, we're enjoying it, and, and, and she starts in with, I so wish my husband was here. He's been gone for 30 years, and he would be here helping you. He'd help you take out the trash and, and, and sweep up and all that stuff. He was such a wonderful man. I so loved him. It was like I was a goddess to him. He did everything for me. And he just, I swear, he lived to just love me. And she starts crying. And I put my hand on hers and said, you know, you, I know it's sad to be without him, but with the way you're describing him, is the kind of love that very few people ever get to experience. So when you look back on the time you had with him and the fact that he's no longer here, remember that you had something that most people never have. I know, I know. And then she looks up and goes, get back to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm in the bathtub now, right now I'm ripping down the wall and I'm saying, why is there fiberglass insulation on an interior wall? Sound deadening, the only reason. Tear out the wall, and I'm pulling out the, the tile, and, the, and the, see, you see that the water's gotten through the tiles, all the, uh, the fiberglass insulation is all soaking wet, has been wet for years. So I gotta take all this out. So while we were sitting at the table, she was touting her husband's virtues and saying, you know, he was so wonderful. He never smoked, he never drank. The only time I ever heard him swear was when he walked into the garage door when it was coming down, and he totally deserved to swear for that. I think I, I used words worse than he did. So here I am, pulling the stuff out of the wall, and I grab the fiberglass, and I pull it out, and I look down. Three empty booze bottles. <laughs> I go to the next one, wiggle it out. Two more. And now I'm realizing what those ovals in the floor were in his workshop. 
hand goes up through, pull the fiberglass away, grab the bottle, bring it down. Bring it back up in there. So she's in the living room with the TV going as loud as it can possibly go. I said, guys, go out and get some black trash bags. They come back in with them, lay out the fiberglass installation, roll the bottles up, put them all in the bag so they don't clank, put them in the truck. We never told her. She didn't need to know. <laughs> what do we got time for, for time here? Current time? When is it? Already? Yikes. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Amy Wilkinson, are you here? I am. Come here. This young lady started something a few years ago. I was at the, at the voters polls, and she, um, come on right, right up here. And so we're kind of advancing this. At this point, I, I have cancer, but I'm, I'm telling her the, about this idea I have, and She's listening intently. I said, oh, does it make sense? And she goes, well, yeah. I said, what do I do with this? She goes, I got just the guy for you. And so she says, I'll make a phone call and have him call you. So a few days later, I get this phone call. Hey, Tom. Yeah. You want to come down here? Sure. <laughs> Don't trip. <laughs> so she connects me. Amy's a neighbor of mine. She, she makes the connection customer. with a <laughs> customer. <laughs> <laughs> so she connects me with this guy, Tom Adams, who is the, the he, he's, he's the big guy. Okay. Real life productions and photography. So she connects me with him and I, she's kind of told him the story. And then he says to me, he calls me up and says, can I meet with you to talk about that? I said, sure. He goes, where do you want to meet? It's like, I'm stuck in chemo for five and a half hours every other Wednesday if you want to come and be a visitor. So he shows up, and we're chatting, and I run this idea by him, and he says to me, that's not an idea. That's a complete idea. You've gotten it from end to end. I said, well, can you do anything with it? And he says, yeah, let me see what I can put together. Well, it's been shelved for four years because my voice was so horrible because I'm actually singing in this. Um, but it, we, I straightened it out as best I could in the last week was still having issues with my voice. But this production, which is going to air here, and as soon as Tom gets back up there, there <laughs> is a culmination of an idea that turned into reality. And we're going to gauge whether or not you like it to see where it goes from here. This is the premiere of this. Um, also, to let you know that the, the arrangement I made here with the Shea Theater is that we, we went to the box office split. So as the tickets came in, the, the money came in for the tickets, the first bulk of it went to pay for the theater, for the lighting, for the techs, for uh, the janitor, the whole nine yards. And we basically cleared that in the first week and a half. So after that, the box office and I split the proceeds of whatever's after that. Every dime that's coming to me from this production is going to f stock the refreshment center at the cancer center, the refreshment room at the cancer center at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Thank you. And Grandma Karen, you here? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you heard that scream. She's, uh, she's going to be in, in, the, uh, in the lobby as we go for um, intermission. And she's going to have a, what is it, a jug? It's a jug. A jug. Um, if, if any of you wish to contribute for that same cause, um, I've been in that room, the chemo room, so many times that I know what it's like to be there for six hours and know you can't push your IV poles to the cafeteria. And the hospital does provide stuff, but this is for the salty stuff, the sugary stuff, the stuff we all want when we're in there. 
Um, and it, 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 it supplements, gets people through. Um, so yeah, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna gauge by the, 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 the applause whether or not you like this and we take it to the next step. Thank you, sweetheart. Roll that beautiful baked bean footage. Taking my mess, my curtain calls. I've been through chemo and cascades and surgery, they've tried it all. And bad mistakes, I've made a few. I consider it a challenge for all human race to find the cure. We are the cancerous, my friends And we keep on fighting till the end We are the cancerous We are the cancerous No time to lose here Cause we are the cancerous Wait, wait, wait. is to polish that more and actually deliver, deliver that right to the American Cancer Society as a group. Thank you. Enjoy your intermission. They actually have, there's alcoholic beverages, non-alcoholic beverages, and mixers. 15, 20 minutes tops. We'll see you back here. Thank you. Thank you. So I've always had a love for water in every shape, form. And I found myself, after the passing of my mom and my dad, being completely drawn to the beach. Um, to the point where I felt like this one day I was at Hammonasset in southern Connecticut. And I got in the parking lot and I could smell the ocean. I could hear the waves, but I couldn't see the ocean because of the dune. And I climbed to the top of the dune, and I swear the waves stopped for a second, and I heard this voice, welcome back, my son. I started building sandcastles, got noted for doing that, um, which took me on various, to various places, uh, but I ended up settling in the Dominican Republic in Punta Cana, it was my vacation destination. And I was going there only to build sandcastles, spending 14, 16 hours a day on one and meeting people from all over the world who were amazed that with a trowel and a dentist tool and a small brush, you could make these really detailed, intricate castles which with stairs and columns and overhangs. So this one trip, I, was, I went down February 6th in 2011 and my plane was delayed I ended up getting there at four o'clock in the afternoon and walked down to the beach knowing I wasn't gonna be able to start anything that day and got to the beach and was dying for a cigarette. I stifled it all day long on the plane and on the tra you know, transfers. And I got to the beach, I took out a cigarette and the lighter I had smuggled all the way through without getting caught. <laughs> and I'm going, Oh, 
you gotta be kidding me. I mean, it's like, I gotta go all the way back to the reception to get a book of matches. And this woman on the lounge said, care for a light? And I looked over, and there's this woman in a black bikini with a French accent offering me a light. I think, oh, thank you very much. And I handed the lighter back to her, and I sat down and just took in the ocean. And half hour later, everybody was packing up and leaving the beach, and I bummed the light off of her again on my way through. And, and she said, where are you from? I said, United States. Where? Massachusetts. Where are you from? I'm from, I'm from Canada. Uh, specifically, uh, about 45 minutes north of Montreal. We split up and glad we met each other. The following day, I get up early and I'm building a sandcastle. And about noontime, that same girl walks up and says, what a beautiful job you're doing. How do you know how to do that? But she was in a throng of people, but I remembered her from the day before. So the following day, um, I, I finished my castle. The photographers come down, take a picture of it, enlarged it, and put it in the lobby saying to people who are coming in, go down and see what he's doing tomorrow. So the following day, I get up late, and I walk down to the beach, and there's no lounge chairs. I go, OK, well, I'm going to build anyways. So as I'm walking down the beach, off in the distance, I see Somebody going like this. And, and I look and there's nobody behind me. And I went. <laughs> and there was this woman, again, in the black bikini, who saved a lounge chair for me. And we went to lunch together, went to dinner together, went to the show together, and realized that we were really attracted to one another. And of course, I'm thinking, where's her husband? Where's her boyfriend? She's wondering where my wife is. So we broke the ice to find out that both of us were the only two single people in the entire resort. <laughs> and we had a blast. And shortly after that, she told me, I have to go home. And I learned that she was separated from her husband, about to be divorced. And she went there to clear her head. So when it came time for her to go, I walked, walked up to the lobby with her. And while we waited for her transfer, and I took out a piece of paper, and I wrote down one word and folded it in half. And she said, what did you write? And I said, nothing really. And when she boarded the bus to go back to the airport, I opened it up and held it in front of her face on the opposite side of the window, and I said, stay. And I still had three days left there. Didn't, I figured, as soon as she's home, she's going to reconcile with her ex-wife. I'll never see this ex-husband. I'm never going to see her again. I came home to 16 emails, all from her, saying, when can we get together? So we learned the, the time travel was going to be six hours one way to, to get there. So she, wasn't, she was impatient enough that she flew to Boston so I could pick her up here to my house. Then I started realizing how special this woman was and braved the trip to Canada and drove up there for the first time, scared to death when I crossed the border and everything was in kilometers. All the signs were in French, don't speak French, but ended up at her place. And as time unfolded, she had a seven-year-old autistic son and a piece of crap little 12-pound dog, the terrifying terrorist. <laughs> and <laughs> through all the years, I've been complaining about this dog, and he's still with us. And my wife says to me, he's always in my way. And I want to go up the stairs. He's laying across the stairs. I come down in the morning. It's dark. He's laying on the stairs. He's trying to kill me. She says, you got to be able to find something good about that dog. Like, He'll fit in the microwave. <laughs> so she cooks a meal for me, and she is a whole chicken, broccoli, and mashed potatoes. I'm carving the chicken, what kind do you want? I want the dark meat. I like the light meat. Uh, and she, she's cutting her broccoli, and she's pushing all the florets off to the side, and I'm eating all of mine, saving the stalks. She goes, Are you going to eat that? So she eats the stems and I eat the florets. I'm like, this is, this is unheard of. <laughs> so we also learned that we had a musical background. She used to be a stage performer, singer. And we find Lady Antebellum, fa fabulous band, and both of our voices are in their range. So now we're doing car harmony in the car wherever we go. I realized one day I said to myself, I got to talk to this girl. And I did. And I said, you know, you're 13 years younger than I am. 
You're an absolute delight. You could have any man in the world you want. What the hell are you doing with me? And she looked at me and said, I know you well enough to know that I deserve you and you deserve me. So I came home and bought a bigger house. <laughs> I've, on, one of my, on many of my visits up north, she was always enamored with the fact that I was wearing pajama bottoms, no top, and I, I'm shaving. So she wants to come in and see me shave. So one, one morning, I'm in there before her, so I take shave cream, I put it all over my face, my forehead, I dig my eyes out like this, and I walk in the kitchen, I was like, do I look stupid like this? <laughs> I got a nod of approval. Another time, I'm in there and I got the shave cream. I'm making little triangles and string, string up around my neck. And I put my little bikini made out of <laughs> shave cream. And I walk in the kitchen. I said, does this look, does this look stupid on me? And she bursts out laughing. and says, I'm just trying to be Caitlyn Jenner. <laughs> so then one morning, I actually wrote, will you marry me in shave cream? And the imprint of that is still on her blouse because I got a big hug and a yes. So we got married in 2013. So in two months will be our 10th year anniversary. This, this woman has been absolutely the love of my life. Uh, thank you. So she's still stuck in Canada because we're dealing with customs and immigration. Three years later, and $10,000 later, and she still can't come to this country. I've got the house, I'm waiting for her, and I get a notification in the mail, in the mail. it's a packet for my colonoscopy. And I've ignored them for nine years in a row. And I, I actually went to the doctor for a physical twice or so in my adult life, and each time they said, pull down your pants, turn around and bend over. <laughs> so when I'm thinking about the colonoscopy, it's really invasive for me. So each year it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna be gone that day, the day they planned it. So they keep trying to reach me. And after nine years, this one secretary calls me and says, you can't postpone this. You don't know what's going on. It's like, I, I feel fine, there's nothing wrong with me. But you don't know that. And chances are you are fine. But if there is something wrong with you and we don't detect it, there'll be 20 people poking around down there, okay? So, all right, all right, all right, so I do it. Go in for the colonoscopy. The doctor says, I know cancer when I see it and you've got it. You need to have surgery right away. So he introduces me to the surgeon and two weeks later, I'm under the knife. They take out 60% of my colon and they, I'm in recovery, and the doctor comes in to tell me days later what happened. He says, I, I promise you, I got every cancer cell in your colon. The margins are all clear, you're, you're, you're okay, except it's already metastasized. It's in your lymph system and your omentum. You're stage four. Doc, I was fine four weeks ago. You're stage four. And to hear those words, like, would you repeat that? And I'm, I, I, this, this is something that happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. It can't happen to me. It did. And that was the beginning of a very long voyage. Um, such a long voyage that I'm going to actually invite my wife, Mano, up to help me. Honey? Yeah. Okay, so we embarked on this long journey, and every time you go to the hospital, you're probably familiar with these, the wristband? Everybody get one at one point in time? I, I call it my all-inclusive round-trip ticket for all the rides on Cooley Dickinson Amusement Park, because <laughs> I've been on all the rides. And to give you an idea of how many rides I've been on, each one of these represents a trip to the hospital. So, so to date, 
I've been stage four cancer for eight years. My liver is now involved, as well as my diaphragm. They took out a lobe of my liver, and as of three weeks ago, I found out that both lobes in my liver are growing again. They've been dormant for years, two years, and now there's two new ones. So. I'm the one who put them together, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is my helper. So you got to help me out with this because I always forget. Okay. So not only am I dealing with the cancer, but I have this T-shirt that says, "God never gives you more than you can handle. He must think I'm a badass." Because on top of what's going on with the chemo and the cancer, I had the shingles, I had a fingernail removed for a fungal infection, I lost some teeth due to um, the, the chemo attacking my mouth, I had, uh, should we tell them? <laughs> I, had, I had a tick affixed to me, of course, on my manhood. So it's four o'clock in the morning, I'm in the shower and I'm washing myself and I'm going, what the hell is that? And I'm not looking until I'm done with the towel and everything. I look down like, you gotta be kidding me. And so I, I wake her up and I say, honey, go online, find out how you get rid of a tick. So she, she's, like, she's laughing hysterically. And so finally we, we dislodge it. And what did you say? Honey, it's a female. <laughs> I passed four kidney stones. I mean, this just goes on and on and on. That's the end of it. That's the end of it. That's... Don't go anywhere. Actually, you don't have to say anything. So, one of the most amazing things I realized out of all of this is that every one of these trips that I made, there was this woman waiting for me to come home. And I have to tell you, if there's a hero in this room tonight, it's her. Oh no, don't do that to me. Mm -hmm. Don't do that to me. I'm doing that to you. Oh no, he's doing that to me. You ready? No. You have no idea how proud I am of you for standing by my side all these years all those trips to come home to someone who cares about me, loves me, fosters our relationship through thick and thin, who feels all the emotions that I do with the good news and the bad news. You are my hero. He is mine. <laughs> oh. So while I'm recovering after hearing that I was stage four, as you know, the imaginary friend reappeared. And he basically said, you know, what's going on? You're, you're shaking. And I was like, I, I know I am. I just got this news and it, it, it's not good. And so we, as in the interview, he says, um, well, you know, I, I know you don't want to do this, but you're going to have to do this and I'm not gonna let you do this alone, I'm going with you. And he, he went on to say, which was um, cut through the inter interview, was that when you get to the other side, you'll have to find me. And when you do find me, you'll see that I found the nicest beach and saved a lounge chair for you. And for eternity, you and I will sit there listening to the sound of the surf and the seagulls, and the distant sound of children's laughter. And it was soothing enough that I was able to make it through that really, really bad news. And now I'm in chemo and recovering from that, even knowing, knowing that the chemo is going to go after the stuff he couldn't get. And I went through the anger, the, 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 the shock, the denial into the acceptance. I mean, I remember yelling at nurses, you didn't spell his name right, the doctor. And I, I suppose at that point I was intolerable because I was so angry this was happening to me. And then given time, 
I softened. I, my wife finally made it from Canada after I went through the surgery and recovery alone. It took squeezing a congressman's neck to get it done, but it got done. And I remember that it, it was her birthday, October 5th, and this was five years ago. And I, I wanted to lavish her with presents, and she absolutely loves thousand piece or more jigsaw puzzles. And she's got an entire room full of them now, but I also bought her five, uh, 200 flowering bulbs. There were tulips and da daffodils and hyacinth and lilies. And she said, this is wonderful. This is, this is incredible. As she ran out of the room with her 1,000 piece, 100 pooping puppies <laughs> jigsaw puzzle. All the dogs were like in the squatting position. <laughs> and I went outside and had already made a map in my mind of where I wanted the bulbs to be. I was out there for a couple hours and I came back and she says to me, you know, not only was that special that you got me those bulbs, but you actually went out there and planted them. And I said to her, if I don't make it through the winter, there's going to be a hell of an I love you in the spring. And I've been able to watch those come up for five years in a row. I, But at the same time, I'm sitting in the chemo room and I'm watching my best friend sitting in the chair next to me having chemo and he dies. He's younger than me. I had to carry his casket with the other pallbearers and do his eulogy. And then my chemistry teacher came in who I thought was visiting and I went to his wake and I see the funerals and the, the, the patients passing through that I know that are customers or acquaintances. And eight years later, I'm the only one standing. And I'm saying, why me? Why am I the, the exception here? And the only thing I could think of was that I had a message to deliver and that I wouldn't be allowed to go until I did. And that's the main reason I'm here this evening, because I'm undergoing more aggressive cancer treatment a week from today, starting a week from today. But in the, in the midst of this, I'm, I'm accepting my mortality. I, I get t-shirts that say, told my wife I want to be cremated. She made an appointment for me for next Tuesday. <laughs> I got another one that says, at my funeral, Take the bouquet off the coffin and throw it to the crowd to see who's next. <laughs> but I'm, I'm also realizing that what if this is the last time that I see you? What if it's the last time anyone sees anyone? What are we doing? Why aren't we hugging? Why aren't we coming out from behind the pandemic to, to flourish in the sun and say, I've been holed up for years. Am I going to be that way forever? Or really, I mean, now's the time in between pandemics, it seems. But I also found that if I could make other people laugh, that would make me laugh. So I pulled out all the guns and went after the medical profession. I go in for my colonoscopy a year after my colon was taken care of. And the same endocrinologist is doing my colonoscopy as the one who found it. So I'm, I've done my colonoscopy prep. I'm on the, on the gurney, and, and I'm, they're, they're ready to sedate me. And I ask the nurse, can you give me a piece of tape? And so she hands it to me. I take out four inches and hand it to her. And I reach in my bag. I take out a Post-it note, and I paste it to my right butt cheek. OK? So they reel me in, and I'm, I'm out of it. And I, I come back out. And the nurse is wheeling me back in, and I'm coming out of the anesthesia, and she's got tears coming on her face. And she goes, Nobody's ever done that before. And the note said, Hey, doc, when you're done, can you write a note to my wife to tell her that you didn't find my head up there? <laughs> and then the, then the next one was, Hey, doc, when you get two thirds of the way in, there's a wood pile on the right. Don't be surprised if chipmunks run out in front of you. 
then the most recent one was, hey doc, you're about to enter the man cave. I left the lights on for you. Can you do me a favor? Can you change the battery in the smoke detector? It's the one over the pool table. <laughs> P.S. If you have less than 10 patients today, does that make me asinine? <laughs> so, so he comes in to tell me my results, and he throws these three stapled pages at me. He goes, read this. So I'm like, the colonoscope entered the rectum at 45. You know, skip to the last page. So I'm reading the last page. He goes, read the bold print. I says, change battery and smoke detector. I was like, <laughs> he looks at me and goes, that's part of your permanent medical record. <laughs> so one day I'm, I'm really frustrated because the clinic I go to every two weeks, the day before I'm going in for my chemo, I have to have blood drawn and I have to give a urine specimen. And this clinic is great. They're open at 7.30 in the morning. I shoot in there, get the stuff done. I'm back on the road at eight o'clock and back to work. So I go there one morning and it says, clinic closed. I gotta go 45 minutes in either direction to deliver this stuff and get the blood drawn. I don't know where I'm gonna do it. My schedule is booked for the day. So it's now like two o'clock in the afternoon. It's like, I gotta find time to do this. I'm running out of day. So I realized my urine specimen is no good from the morning. So I, I create another one and head off. And <laughs> I said, I would pay 20 bucks to see the look on the face of the person who takes the cap off this urine specimen because I had asparagus for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you want to close the clinic? You're going to pay. <laughs> so, so this female doctor who's like, she's, she's got armor on. Uh, you can't get through it. She's very clinical, very professional. And I'm sure she has to deliver a lot of bad news to people. So she's, she's, she's insulated. And I'm like, I got to break through that armor. This is my full-time job now. So every once in a while, I'll tell her a joke, then maybe an off-color joke. And one, one day, we started talking about the price of groceries. And she said, I know. I went to the grocery store the other day. And I wanted to buy a big, fat, juicy steak, and it was so expensive, I put it back and I got chicken. I was like, hey, I'm getting somewhere here. <laughs> She's talking to me. So she, one day she says to me, now you don't have to answer this. It's not a medical question. It's a personal question. Um, but people healthier than you, sicker than you, younger than you, older than you, they all seem to have bucket lists. It's like, again, you don't have to answer this, but do you have a bucket list? Says, of course I do. Would you mind sharing one of the things on the list? Not a problem. The one thing I really want to do, I can't do because of the cancer. She goes, what's that? I wanted to be a male stripper, but <laughs> I've got so many scars that people would pay me 20 bucks to get off the stage. And she is howling. I said, okay, I'm a glutton for punishment. Tell me, tell me another one. I stole this from Jeff Dunham, the ventriloquist. I want to be a greeter at Walmart. She goes, well, you can probably still do that. What would you say? Like, Welcome to Walmart. Get your shit and get out. <laughs> <laughs> so really, when you're looking at the limited amount of time you may have left in your life, you, 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 got, you got to reconcile. So I'm thinking all the things I don't want to think about on my deathbed. And I know there's a lot of people that probably took things I said the wrong way, and they deserve an apology. And I made this list and promised myself every Saturday afternoon, I'm going to cross at least two off the list. Some days it was really easy. The number you've reached is no longer in service. Or you leave a message and they never call you back. Um, but there's, there's a, one really notable one. OK, so I. I I go to this party, gotta be 23 years ago. And I'm at this party, and everybody's having a good time, but there's this one buffoon. He's like six inches taller than me, he's loud. His, his wife is sitting there, she's demure blonde. And I'm watching this guy pat this woman's butt as she's going by, and I look at his wife, she's going, does it all the time. And he's, my, I, you know, my family's such a pain in the ass, and, and I hate my job, and this is wrong, and, and my car broke the other day. I'm listening to him because he's louder than everybody else, and I'm just, I'm going down. After half an hour, I said, you know, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. I can't avoid him. So I left. And two years later, I get invited back to the same house, and it's a costume party on Halloween. 
you got to come dressed to the nines. So I show up in my Chuck Norris outfit with the hat <laughs> and a duster and the ammo belt and the plastic uh, pistol. And other people are there, the, the perfect quarterback and cheerleader with the pom-poms. And I hear this voice in the other room. I go, you got to be kidding me. He's here again. And he's dressed as a welder. He's got the welder's hat, he's got two sparklers going, filthy overalls. And then this woman walks in and we all stop breathing. She was wearing the entire outfit of the Statue of Liberty with the torch, authentic. And she, it was when they were refurbishing the exterior and she made hundreds of sets of staging out of toothpicks. So she had a rope around her neck and the staging hung all the way down to her feet with little workmen on them. <laughs> Everyone stopped breathing. We're looking at that. And I kind of whispered to her, what are you going to do when you have to go to the bathroom? She goes, I figured it out. I went before I came, but yeah, I hope I don't have to. And we're in awe. And here comes Phil, big Phil. And he looks in. Somebody must be really lonely. And I looked at him. I, said, I don't know who the hell you think you are, but you're the most depressing example of a human being I've ever heard. You know, I, I think you're an asshole. And people applauded. <laughs> but he thought the applause was for him. So, he's like, so what do you want to do? You want to take this outside? It's like, I would be so afraid that I damaged the three good blood, brain cells in your head that I, I'm not going to take that chance. No, I mean it. Come on, let's go outside right now. It's like, no, you've driven me away again. I hope you enjoy your life. Uh, I, 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 I hope I never see you again. So I'm going down a list, and Phil's name's on a list. It's like, why did I write that down? So, you see, I got to deal with it. Hello? Yeah, hi, is this Phil? Uh, yeah, who's this? It's Frank Marchand. Remember me? Oh, yeah, I remember you. So listen, I got these health issues, and I'm not sure much, how much time I have left, and you're my, on my list of people to call. And uh, how, how so? It's like, well, I'm looking back to like 25 years ago, I think it was when I first met you. And I'm, I'm looking back and I'm saying, geez, you know, we were both young. We both had a couple of beers. And things got out of hand. I'm glad they didn't get more out of hand. But I thought about this a lot. And I, I really needed to call you um, and, and just tell you that I think you're an asshole. One of the most freeing things I did in my life. It's like, what's he gonna do? Come choke me with my chemo tubing? <laughs> Never hear from him again. I was like, okay. When, when, you, when you get to the end of life like that, you say, I can do this. There's no reason. I'm not gonna apologize to him. So I want you to cross your arms. Okay. Now, I'm sure everybody here has done that. Now, I want you to look down. Is your left arm over your right arm, or is your right arm over your left arm? Okay, anybody who's got their left arm over their right arm, raise your hand. Anybody who's got their right arm over their left arm, raise your hand. Okay, so it's like 50-50 from what I can see. So I asked you to cross your arms, and you all did it beautifully. But half of you did it one way, and half of you did it the other way. Nothing wrong with that. Now what I want you to do is to cross your arms the way you don't normally, the way the other people do. Kind of weird, isn't it? You've been doing it all your life. Imagine if you were so petty that you said, I don't want to associate with anybody who doesn't cross their arms the same way that I do. And you eliminate 50% of the people in this room from being your friend. And I don't like people who have hair color that's pink and red and green and yellow. There goes another 10%. And I don't like people from this religion or that ethnic, uh, ethnicity. There goes another 10 or 15%. And I don't like and I don't like and I don't like. And you find yourself 
down to three people in the entire uh, theater. And those three people are narcissistic bigots. <laughs> now, you didn't choose to be there, but you certainly chose who not to be with that puts you in that category. So with the limited amount of time you have left in your life, can you imagine that one of those people that crosses their arm differently than you could be a good person? And you're just eliminating them because you're characterizing. And, and this is what we do in life. It's, it's, there's always something that's wrong about somebody. But as with my wife, if you can find the good in someone, someone who's trying hard, and just take the moment to say, I am so proud of you. Because no one said that to me since my dad died. And when I realized that and the impact that it has, it's words with the air you're going to exhale anyways. So I'm, it's a week before Christmas last year, and I'm driving in my work truck, and I'm noticing that this blue foreign sedan is following me. It's not on my tail, but it's following me like everywhere I go. And eventually I put my left blinker on, Carpenter's left blinker on, follows me into a condo complex where my next stop is. And I go by the first street, and the car follows me. Go by the second street, follows me. Goes by the third street, follows me. Now I'm on the end of the road with a cul-de-sac. And I, I pull in, and I back into my customer's driveway, and this car pulls in in front of me. And I'm thinking, somebody's got a plumbing emergency, they're, they're chasing me down. But I couldn't see who it was because of the glare on the windshield. And I step out of my truck, and this beautiful blonde woman comes running up to me with her arms open. I recognize her as one of my customers. I'm like, Bonnie, what are you doing? And she wraps her arms around me and says, I would never be able to enjoy this holiday season unless I knew you were okay. What did it cost? That, that totally raised my spirits for the holiday season and showed that somebody cared and loved me even though we're, everybody's happily married. It, it took 10 minutes out of her life, but it meant the world to me. And every single one of you in this room can do the same thing and change another person's attitude and potentially even the course of their life. So I've had to deal with the, the, the end of life, thinking about it and what's going to happen. So this is where my wonderful imaginary friend comes in. He and I have now become buddies ever since he showed up after my surgery. He's been watching out for me. He's been coaching me. Do this, don't do that. Listen to the doctor. Um, but, you know, I'm concerned about you and I, I want to make sure I can do everything I can for you. So here's a conversation I have with him. This is the imaginary friend. So what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about dying and, you know, what it means. Why is everybody so preoccupied with what's going to happen when you die? What do you mean? Well, you're going to die, right? Yeah. But we want to know how. Well, have you ever thought about where you came from be to begin with? I said, no. Well, why don't we start there? It might give you a clue where you're going. All right, so you're going to tell me something? I'm not supposed to. You're going to tell me, aren't you? Yeah, but you've got to keep it secret. In front of 200 people, right? <laughs> just ignore them, okay? This is just, you, know, you listen. So here's where you came from. You don't even know it. Tens of thousands of years ago, you were just a swirling mist. You could change your form into a ball or a sphere. You could stretch out. And you're in with billions of other spheres. And you have no direction. You have no deadline. You're just you're, you're a, a ball of energy. And you're able to see everything that's going on. So you know, maybe 200 years ago, you, you float down towards the Earth. And you start seeing what's going on. And you're seeing, you know, death and famine and earthquakes. And you see other people who are feeding the hungry. And, and, and you, you, formed a, you formed an idea in your mind that 
God, if I was ever a human being, I would be down there and I would pull that woman's arm so she got out of the way of the oncoming bus so she wouldn't die. And you, you, you have actually, as a spirit, thought what I could do, all the good things I could do if I just had a body. And you, you, you dwell on it. This, the only thing you could do, because you can't do anything. And then one day this call comes up, and 15 million of the spirits are called. And th you're told that one of the 15 million is going to get a human body. And you just, you come apart thinking, I would give anything. And you think of all those good things you're going to do. And then all of you are turned into microscopic tadpoles. And whoever swims the fastest will get the human body. And let me tell you, dude, you are a swimmer. I'm telling you, you swam your ass off. And you, you made it there. And you connected with the egg to become a, a, the beginning of a human being. And you were reminded that if you got to be a human being, you have 24 hours after you made that connection to dwell on what it was you were going to do. Pump yourself up realizing all the good things you're going to do when you get there. Because in 24 hours, you will no longer be a spirit. Looking on, you will be the beginning of that human being. And when you're born, you'll have no recollection of floating around. All you'll have is what's left of what's in your heart that you knew you wanted to do. And you will grow and you'll, you'll, if you'll affect the world in whatever way you're going to. And you'll be tempted to sway from your path by things like this. And you're going to have to figure out what's most important to you. But if you have it in your heart that you're going to be good, then run with it. And then one day when your life is over, you're going to leave that body as the spirit that you were before. And you're going to be able to move away and watch that vehicle that carried you for however many years rot and decay. And then you're going to have to deal with judgment. And it won't be, you won't be judged by others. You'll be judged by the spirit that you were before you became the human being. So you will be looking at yourself and what you did in your human life, whether it was good or it was bad, for eternity, you'll be looking at what you did. So when you have time left, Frank, you have time left. If you want to save that woman from the bus, you don't have to be there. You can do something as important. But with the time you have left, think about what you want to think about for the rest of eternity. And I found that really motivating. Jeez, you're pretty good at that. You must have done that before, huh? Yeah, but I haven't told anybody about it. So now I move on to Quickly, credits. And I, I, got, I got one more after this, okay? So there are people here I, I must thank before we get any further. Richard Trousdell, the Emeritus Professor of Theater from U, UMass Amherst. I called him because he's a customer of mine. And I said, Dick, didn't you used to have something with the theater? He goes, I am the theater at UMass. I said, can you find me a casket? <laughs> he said, uh, I'm retired, I'll find you a casket which, as you see, so he directed me to call Julie Fife, the production manager at UMass Department of Theater, who connected me with Lisa Rizzo, the administrator at Smith College Department of Theater, who connected me with Amy Putnam, the administrator auxiliary staff at the Smith College Department of Theater, and I actually went to Smith College to try out the casket. <laughs> I got in it, it's got a beautiful satin pillow, it serves the purpose, and I was figuring, how am I going to get that up here? So I called a moving company. 
and they said it would be between four and five hundred dollars to transport it from Northampton to here and from here back to Northampton. Amy Putnam said, tell me about what you're doing with this story. And I told her, and she said, well, we're going to waive any of the liability fees and everything else, and we'll bring it up to the stage and pick it up for free. <laughs> Everywhere I've gone in this program, people have lined up to just say, let me help you. Tom Adams from Real Life Productions and Photography. I asked him, what would the budget be for filming this event and doing the audio? And he said, tell me what you're doing. So I told him, and he looked at me and said, this is one of those things that I think is powerful enough that I'm doing it for free. Tom Adams. A special shout out to all the doctors and nurses and staff and radiologists and phlebotomists and all those people who have laid their hands on me at the Cancer Center at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Hats off to you, you guys are the best. <laughs> to Karen Brown for finding me with my arms in the toilet. <laughs> So Linda Tardiff, the um, managing director of the Shea Theater, she has been marvelous at keeping me posted as what's available, what can happen, what we can do for you. And I just can't say enough. This whole experience has been wonderful. Yeah, yeah. To Connor Roberg, lighting and sound. Yeah. To Monty Belmonte and Kellis Smith from the fabulous 413 at NEPM, who hosted an interview with me and Karen Brown this past Monday. <laughs> to Klondike Sound for the wireless microphone. <laughs> and of course, to um, Marcy and Dix Glove, who actually, Marcy, I think, was the one who found me four years ago and did an interview. Um, so that's, that's the list, but I've got a couple more things to do. I'm envisioning the end of my life, and I'm thinking about all the ways I've been told he could die. And it includes the Grim Reaper, and the monster under the bed, and the boogeyman, and all the stuff that was intended to keep us children in line. Um, but I had this wave come over me one day, and I said, what's going on? And in this dream, I'm, I'm looking down, I'm holding a newborn child, maybe three days old. And as I'm looking at it, realizing this thing is helpless. If I drop it, it's going to break. And it needs to be nourished and fed and kept warm and, and cleaned. It's, this, is, this is a lot of work. But as I'm holding it, the baby's growing in my hands. And now, now my hands are spreading holding this child. And I, I pass the baby off and I see it in a high chair. And I see the spoon coming to its mouth and I see it taking its first bite. And then I see the baby holding the spoon and doing it himself. And then I see the child on the floor rocking back and forth and then coming up and crawling across the floor, then grabbing the leg of a table and pulling itself up and wobbling back and forth, laughing incredibly, because it's, it's like finding its freedom. And then the baby starts walking then running. Then the child's riding a bicycle. This is all happening before my eyes. Meanwhile, this child is like racing up this hill, completely disregarding safety, totally comfortable with, like, I'm doing this, I'm going full out. And he's, then the child's in a car, and it's burning rubber going to the top of this hill. And it gets to the crest of the hill and stops. And the kid who was in that car is me, stepping out of the car. And I'm looking down the other side of the hill, 
and realizing this is midlife. I've made it to the top of the hill and I'm looking down the other side. And as I'm, as I'm looking down, I'm realizing that's really steep and I'm going to go really fast and I don't know if I'll be able to stop. And I'm considering, okay, well, as I start down this hill, I'm already getting shorter. My spine is compressing. And the, the, the further I go, the shorter I get. And I'm realizing that one day I won't be able to drive and I won't be able to ride a bicycle. And I certainly won't be able to ride a tricycle. But then I'm going to get to the point where I can't run and probably can't walk and probably can't even crawl. And then somebody's going to have to feed me. And I'll probably end up in diapers and be helpless. So as I'm coming down this hill, I'm shrinking in size and I'm actually reverting back to the size I was as a child. And I get to the point where I'm about two and a half years old and I just dig my bare heels into the dirt and pile the dirt up in front of me and I stop. And I look down and I'm two and a half years old and I'm wearing red swim trunks and little floaties, one on each arm. And I'm standing by the edge of an in-ground pool. And I look in the pool and there's all my relatives, my friends, everyone who's gone before me and they're all yelling, come on, come in, it's no big deal, we all did it. And my father's standing there in the shallow end of the pool, he's going, jump to me. I'll catch you, don't you worry, jump to me. And I'm hesitant and I'm looking and I kind of walk over this way and tap the puddle and I'm coming back and I'm looking at him. And I spot my favorite dog in my whole life, Jake across the pool. I, little, little guy, hey, Jakey. And the dog goes, oh, he recognized my voice. He goes running down the apron as fast as he can, comes around the corner, and he almost bowls me over. He's swiggling, and he's, he's like, he, he moaning, and, and I'm Pat and said, Jakey, Jakey, I love you, I love you, I love you. I mean, he's, he won't stop. And I'm like, this, Jakey, I love you. And I look at my dad, and he's saying, jump to me, I'll catch you. And I reach down and pat Jake's head, and I crouch, and I jump, and he catches me, and he wraps his arms around me, and Thank you. I, I got a text. Hold on just one second. From my imaginary friend. Cut it out. I, mean, I don't even know how to text. <laughs> Show's over. Back in the box. I left a present for you under the podium. Does a good tape job. Right? This is when you need a wife. <laughs> this guy know me or what? And a bottle opener. <laughs> okay. Wait, wait, wait. wait. He's, 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 texting, he's, he's texting me again. You're nearing the end of your life as a human being. You'll never have a body again. But I put in a good word for you 
and someday in the future, you may get to visit this heaven again. I think you would make a great imaginary friend for a human being needing direction. You're on your own now. See you at the beach.